Good morning once again. All these little babies are getting bigger. Bigger. They're walking now. Wow. Little one of my cheeks. Today is the 18th of uh, December. And um, just a week away from Christmas. And uh, the good thing we know about Christmas is, is that Jesus Christ wasn't born on December 25th, but possibly he was conceived on, on the 25th. So that, you know, changes things. When you find out that, um, when you find that out, oh, this is my list of things I should, you know. You already gave me a show of hands. It's going to be here next week. June, January 1st, which is a Sunday, we'll, we will hold a the New Year's potluck feast, after morning services. Um, Dana and Gloria will bring the chicken and the sausage. Everybody else, please bring a side dish. Does anybody want a ham? Is anybody a ham? <laughs> We um, have to take down the tables today when I'm done, and they're being put over there. If you notice, the coat rack is open, so you can use the coat rack when you come in. Okay? Anything else? Dear? She's over there. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Um, this is First Thessalonians lesson number 159. It's kind of um, reviewing and going over what I talked about last week. We talked about that message that God communicated in the heavens, and the people could read it. So, yeah. this is why the wise men, Gentiles, came bearing gifts to see the Christ. They knew when He was going to come. Today, it is written down in a book. Okay. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of the law, of this law in a book, and of that which is before the priests and the Levites. And then Psalm 19, 1 to 6 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day, in, day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night Showeth knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. Their line, which means communication, is gone out through all the earth and the, way, the word to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Things sound familiar. It isn't about Christ. At the end of the, um, come out of the chamber and the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now, in case you got confused last week, King David wrote Psalm 19, and Ezra wrote Psalm 119. King David, Psalm 19, Ezra, Psalm 119. Um, what is the best way of understanding the 12 constellations in the zodiac? How, how many of you stand out there and look at the stars? Not many. The best way to understand this is the great sphinx in Egypt. The sphinx is a woman on a lion's body. The, the zodiac starts with Virgo, it stands for virgin, and runs its course all the way around to Leo, the lion. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. That's Revelation 5.5. 5. Now, a circuit is something that has beginning and an ending. It begins somewhere and ends somewhere. The first advent, via the virgin, Mary, and at the end of the line come, cometh, the end of the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, which is Jesus Christ. This is, they could, they, time passed, they could read this in the stars. We can't today. If we know the Bible story, 
We can read it back into the Zodiac, but it was there in the stars to start with. E.W. Bullinger's book, The Witness of the Stars, traces the whole history of each sign of the Zodiac. Genesis 11, verses 1 and 2, and Genesis, Genesis 10, 8 to 10. Let's go back there. Genesis chapter 11. Now, those of you that might not know, Genesis chapter 11 is where they build the Tower of Babel and all the other, the other stuff that goes on. Let me see here. Genesis 11, 1 and 2. Genesis 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now go back to Genesis chapter 10. And read verses 8 to 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Eric and Akkad and Gelna in the land of Shinar. This is, Shinar is Babylon. That's where the civilization began. The land of Shinar, the land area around Babel, the east, is a seabed from which the civilization of Nimrod finds its beginning. So in Genesis 11, Genesis 11 is about the things happening during the time of Genesis 10. In Genesis 11:3, instead of using stone created by God, they prefer man-made material, brick, that will hold together in, in almost the same way. So they build a city. Did God tell them to build a city? He never told them. What did he tell them to do? Scatter. Did they do it? So were they going against God when they decided to build a city? Yeah, they were. This is what Cain did, too. He built a city. Cain did it, and now Nimrod does it. And they also built a, temple, built a steeple. In the Bible, a tower is a description of a religious, religious artifact. God himself said, Psalm 144, verse 2, My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield in whom, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Our high tower is to be the Lord. But there's a spiritual element to this. When you walk around, you see all these steeples and all that. That's, that it comes from, that has nothing to do with God. We have the Harvest Bible Church not far from us, where we live. And it used to be a, a big grocery store. There's a lot of square footage. Big grocery store, whatever it was. Something, um, remember what that was? It's a, it's a warehouse, yeah. And now it's a church. And then something happened with the leadership a while back. And it's still a church. They, they lost a lot of attendance, from what I've told. But they're still there. And they have a tower. They had this big warehouse thing, a flat roof, then they built the tower. Does that make you godly? Does that make you godlike? What were these people in Genesis 11 doing? They were building using man-made materials. They took the earth and they made the brick, okay? Dried it out in the sun. And they built the tower and they, they wanted to reach the most high God. Instead of doing what the Lord said, to scatter. They built a city. Not scatter, not scatter, exactly as King did, and he built a city. Moses warns Israel against the groves and high places where idolatrous sacrifices are offered. The origin here is Genesis 11. They build a city in rebellion against God and a tower, a religious system, and they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Genesis 11, 4a. God never told them to think about the heaven. They were to replenish the earth. So right from the get-go, 
In Genesis 3, Satan added a three-letter word. You shall not surely die if you eat, eat, eat that apple. And it just, just continues. Um, let me see here. What made them think about going to heaven? Something they knew about out there they longed for. They were going to get there without God. Where God did not want them to be. Think about that. I'm going to get there myself. Think, think about people who tell you you have to work for salvation. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Folks, you don't have to do anything to get saved. Just believe. You don't even have to say it. Believe in your mind and your heart. The Lord knows it. There's many verses that show this. They were going to get there without God, and God did, did not want them to be. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad the whole earth. Genesis 11, 4b. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest what God commanded would happen. All of this is Babylon. Now read what Satan said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. The word Genesis means the beginning. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, No, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees which is, of the, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat it of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The God's just one tree amidst other trees. Don't take the fruit from that one tree. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. When they took that, well, let me finish here. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. A good way to explain that, God won't accept your good, your goodness, or righteousness. He won't accept the evil. He's not going to get, uh, say mankind's good. I'm going to build a steeple that will get to God. He won't accept that. Man's own righteousness. And no man's evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He wasn't supposed to do that. Now we're sitting in the condition where we got. So God gives us the, the dispensational significance three times in Romans 1. Paul's first placed book, the sixth written, his first placed book. Romans 1, 24 to 28. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working things, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over, he gave them up, to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's a phrase, this convenient, not convenient is a phrase, and look what it means in, in Acts 22, verse 22. I want you to see this. In Acts 22, verse 22. And they gave him audience, this Paul, Unto this word, and and they lift, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, 
For it is not fit that he should live. The phrase, not convenient. Romans 132, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This concept, misery loves company, comes from the Bible. You've all heard that phrase. I've used it a lot. Prophetically, this is Revelation 17.5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mystery Babylon starts religiously and politically back in Genesis. And this rebellion does not end until the, until the Antichrist. Its roots are from Genesis, part of which is astrology, stargazing, observing the heavens to predict the future. How many read your horoscope every day? You don't have to raise your hands. You've done it before, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Its roots are from Genesis. Like I said, part of it, which is part of which is astrology, stargazing, observing the heaven to predict the future. Hebrews six nine, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie. I know this is in the book of Hebrews, but applies to us too. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. It's the same word. It's the Greek word elpis. Okay? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. A joyful, confident expectation of a future certainty. The moment you trust that Christ died for your, for your sins, your, for all your darkness, you're indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. Now you've got a new resident living inside of you, and you can work with that according to the words. You, you know how to, you get better at it as you, as you use it more. Um, Romans 14, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now that's Romans 4. It's talking about Abraham. First his name was Abram, exalted father, then Abraham, father of many nations. Okay, before the circumcision, then after the circumcision. Romans 4 talks about the faith of Abraham, and, and, and we, we get to partake of that. If you ever went in, in Romans chapter 11, or Romans chapter 4 and read about that, um, it's it's something to read about. It's very, very, it's good, it's great. If you have God's actual words, they are going to tell you what is going to happen in the future. What's going to happen in the future? Sam, are you going to die? Yeah. I'm going to die. I wish it was today, maybe. That'd be, uh, you know, Rick, are you going to die? Yeah, we're all going to die. Yeah? We know that. We can predict what's going to happen in the future. You realize that? Yeah, I'm going to die. Somebody tells you they're predicting the future. Somebody, well, I, I can do the same thing. You know, I'm going to die. You know, come on. If I can know where I'll probably spend eternity, we can be sure and have confidence in God's written word. Now, when I got a hold of this, this, this changed everything in my life. When God abandoned using the heavens as a method of communication, it fell into corrupt hands. He abandoned it at the flood. <coughs> Prior to the flood, his message was written in the stars. After Babel, Genesis 11, he calls out Abram, Genesis 12, to Israel were committed the or oracles of God, that's Genesis, uh, Romans 3, 2. They were to be God's oracle to the world. Were they? Did they ever become that? No. Why not? They come from Adam too, right? In Matthew 2, they, the Gentiles, see his star in the east, which is a reference to Numbers 24. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come, out, come a star of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Balaam talks about his star in connection with a scepter to rule. These guys are fixated on stars. 
That's why you have Gentiles being talked about, as I mentioned last week, in Matthew 2. There's not three wise men, there's just wise men. We don't know if there are three wise men. But they read, the, they read the stars, okay, he's going to be born over here, and they wanted to see the Christ. Amos 5, 24 through 26. But let the judgment run down as waters, and the righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chayim, your images. The star of your God, small g, which ye made to yourselves. Israel out in the wilderness was building false gods. Remember the thing about the golden calf and all that? You know, the, you know when Moses came down the mountain? They were dancing and cavorting around. You know, it's just, they threw all the, the two golden calves. They threw all the, took all the gold off and he fashioned it like two golden calves. Israel wanted to add Moloch which is a bad God, to the group of gods, small g, who run the stars. All this goes back to Genesis 6, 1. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of which they chose. What were they trying to do? They're trying to infect the seed line, weren't they? When did this happen? In Genesis 4, which covers a long period of history, through Cain and Abel, through Noah. Genesis 5 gives us the genealogy of Adam through Noah, and Genesis 6 goes back to the days of Cain to show the need for the flood. Now, when you read those for a few chapters of Genesis, keep this and, and think about this. Think about, like, I was born in Evergreen Park, which is the first suburb right outside of Chicago, in a little company, Mary Hospital. Okay? And I never thought of cities in, in a bad way until I, until I got saved. I said, this was, you know, they built a city in rebellion to God. And it, what is Chicago? It's a big city with a lot of murder in it, in the suburbs, right? Is the city going to please God? Building the city going to please God? Well, they took that, they, took, they threw away the stuff that God wanted them to do, and they went and built a city, and all these things happened to them at the flood, after the flood. The problem began with Cain in building a city after God told them to scatter and then Lamech took, took two wives. How many people here have more than one wife? I better not see any hands because a, a gun will come out there. Andy, but maybe he wants two wives, I don't know. I have one and one's enough, let me tell you. <laughs> Galatians 4, 19 and 20. And Lamech took unto him two wives the name of, of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. There's husbandry right there. Why? For the city folks. They are developing a whole economy. How do we get our food today? We go to the grocery store. Who supplies it? That's what he's talking about. Nimrod says he's, he's a mighty hunter. He was supplying food for them to eat. Come, come with me. They're developing a whole economy. Nimrod is a hunter, wife for the city folks. And his brother, Galatians 4.21, and his brother's name was Jubal. There's Jabal, then Jubal. He was the father of such as handled the harp and organ. Now they have developed arts and entertainment. To have arts and entertainment, you must have leisure time and disposable income. Verse 22. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of, of every 
artif artificer, in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubalcain was Numa. Now they have metallurgy. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. They needed to know chemistry to form allies, stronger metals, industrialization. These guys knew about the earth sciences. Sciences. They had an advanced culture, math, science, arts, etc. What happened? God killed everybody. Read again Genesis 6. He started the flood. He gave Noah 120 years to build the ark, and everybody was killed. Only eight people made it by staying out of the water. Their boat was like a big box with a roof on it for stability. He had the measurements to do it, to do it a certain way. They got all those animals and brought them on the ark. And then the rain started coming. So the outcome was bad. The thoughts of mankind were just with, were all, all vain and all vanity. Genesis 6, verses 4 and 5. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that. Don't miss that. After that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What was the outcome? These giants, called the Nephilim, the sons of God, angelic, celestial creatures, aliens of the earth from the realm of the stars, angels are associated with, with stars, they invade the earth and conduct procreation experiments, biogenetic engineering, abnormal offspring, men of extraordinary enhanced stature and intelligence, men of renown. If you study the history of ancient cultures, you will be a consistent, you will see a consistent storyline of, of aliens from the outer space. When God abandoned the message he put in the heavens, man's ability to read it was corrupted by these angelic beings doing to the word of God what people do today to the written word of God. What do they do within their Bibles? Corrupted, right. You have to change the words X amount to get the money. That's where it goes back to. It isn't... Uh, Money isn't the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And that's what we see in our time right now. I want you to go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 10, uh, Psalms chapter 110. Psalms 110. This is on the outline. Psalms 110. Mm -hmm. Remember I told you about the, the Lord all capital letters, letters and small letters? Like the L is capitalized, but Lord, all, L O R D, all capital, the, or G O D, all capital. That's Jehovah God, okay. And sometimes you see the small L or the capital L, small O R D. That's like Adonai, the title to the Father or the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay.
Let me read 1 to 7. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The people, thy people shall be within the day of the power, of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Does that sound familiar to you? The word. Where do you see that word coming up in the New Testament? Melchizedek. Hebrews. Hebrews. There's a connection there, right? Connection. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the, the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. This psalm was written by David. It's possibly the clearest Old Testament prophecy about his ascension, the ascension of Jesus Christ, and the reason behind it. There's, there's five things here. Our Lord was to be rejected by his enemies on earth. Number two, he was to be honored and exalted by his Father in heaven. We've seen that. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. His enemies were to be punished. They will. This punishment was to begin during his absence. It hasn't happened yet. And we miss out on that. It was to end with his enemies under his feet. Now, take a look at Romans 16. Romans 16. So the fifth thing was, it was to end with his enemies under his feet. Now consider Paul. He wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. Okay? When I showed my brother this verse, Ron, he practically fell off the chair. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What are you doing as members of the church, the body of Christ? What are you doing with your feet? You're standing on Satan. You're stepping on him. Do you think he likes it very much? Well, let me read you another verse. You're in Romans 16, Romans, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 8. So I just mentioned to somebody earlier, this is the best piece of news that mankind got. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world under our glory. Now, prophecy was given since the world began, but the mystery was kept secret before the world, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would, have not, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan thought when he killed Satan, that's it. I get, get to take control of the, of the earth and of the, the heavenly realm. It didn't happen. He led, kept, God, God beat him. He tricked him. His death and dying for our sins is what tricked his adversary. How do you think he feels about that? Do you think, do you think you're going to get attacked? Do you think dispensational is going to become like a swear word? Do all in Asia leave Paul? How many friends, or used to be friends, how many friends did you have before, before becoming dispensational? I lost everybody, but I made do. You know why this is so important? Because Satan doesn't know he's Satan doesn't know he's he's beat yet. But in Revelation twelve, he knows he's beat. Let me start at verse seven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, 
and, and the dragon fought against his angels. Uh, that's Isaiah 34, okay? More in heaven. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now this is Romans chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 12. We are not, we will not go through this time period. We will be raptured before that. And the great dragon, dragon was cast out, and that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud whisper, a loud voice saying in heavens, in heaven, now has come the salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They were willing to die. And here's the verse. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, that will be us, the church, the body of Christ. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He doesn't know that yet, but he will then. And we're not going to be part of that. This is what dispensational Bible study teaches you, and you got the verses to prove it. It's just... Anyway... David knew, I was talking about Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord. I said to a guy one time, if I could show you the Lord, the, the God believed his, his son was, a, was God, we, it was Jehovah's Witness I said it to. If I could show you a verse that God was, you know, his father made, you know, he was God, would you believe the message in the Bible here? I was going through, through the... Uh, this junior college, I set up a table every Wednesday and sit in the student union, and I'd hand out I'd hand out tracts and all that for a while. And he was chapter one, verse eight. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. When I showed him that verse, verse 8, Hebrews 1, 8, he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was God, even though he told me he would believe. He thought I wasn't, wasn't going to be able to show him a verse about that. I pulled out this verse. I pulled out Psalm 110. There's a connection there. And then in verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 20. I thought the priest came out of Levi. Jesus Christ comes from Judah. Tribe of Judah. There weren't, there weren't any priests from, from Judah, was there? This meant things had to change. Whether the, Hebrews 6, verse 20, Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now the word priest or priests, is not, you will never see the word priest in Paul's epistles. It goes from Acts 26, jumps all the way, Hober, to Hebrews 2. After the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, verse 7, 1, 7 chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning the, from the slaughter of the kings and blessed, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Something changed, didn't it? Look at verse 11. If therefore perfection were of the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that 
another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not called after the order of Aaron. Well, something changed. But the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Who came along and gave this faith about grace? Where do you learn about grace? This faith from Paul. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So there was a first covenant, then there was a second covenant. Okay? He goes down here and he says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, this is, I'm in verse 11, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant hath made the first old, now, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the Jews in the ages to come will be under a new covenant because the first one was not righteous. And you need a new priest for that from a new tribe and that turns out to be Jesus Christ. Back to the outline here. We were talking about the Nephilim, the, those big creatures, um, the giants in the Bible. They were men of renown. And they were trying to infect the seed line until they were wiped out. What does this have to do with 1 Thessalonians 5? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of Antichrist. Look at Peter, 1 Peter 3, 16 to 20. Again, this is also in the age to come. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Do you understand that phrase? If somebody's mad at you for preaching the truth, that's better than you punching a guy. Okay? You were doing good. You are trying to get him, him or her the message, and you're, you're suffering for that. But Christ also hath suffered for sins. Remember, remember now, he wants all men to be saved, then to come to the knowledge of the truth. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, by staying out of the water. After the flood, God said, it will not be the seed of any woman, but just the seed line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Israel goes into the promised land, the giants are already there, holding it as the sons of Belial. So the promised land could not be occupied and used by them, by the promised nation, to accomplish God's promised purpose. Never came to that. But God had a time plan. Israel needed a redeemer first. These wise men in Matthew 2 were taken seriously. You know they had a reputation since they were able to see Herod with their story. They had an accepted status. Daniel was ten times smarter because he trusted God's word. Jude 6, and the angels kept not their first estate. How did they do that? They had like a stargate, right, didn't they? This is the angel, angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter 10. Okay, that's, they had this written in the stars. Today we trust in this book, which makes us spiritually able to stand fast against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6.11 Just as he focused on destroying Israel and God's plan and purpose in it, today, today his focus is on us, the church, the body of Christ. Today we have his armor, we have him, and we have 
and we have his word, and he has supplied us with all our need. And don't forget, you can predict the future. We're all going to die. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for this time, giving your word, and I just pray that we stand fast. Amen.